Modern Slavery in the Global Economy, next on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs at UWM and Milwaukee Public Television present International Focus, a global magazine linking Wisconsin and the world. Welcome to International Focus. I'm Robert Sigliano, Director of the Institute of World Affairs at UWM. Many people think of slavery as a regrettable historical practice which a more enlightened human society has managed to end. In reality, despite being formally illegal everywhere, slavery has survived in various forms and continues to support many enterprises in the global economy. To help us understand the plight of the victims of modern slavery and what is being done to end the practice worldwide, we're pleased to be joined by Dr. Kevin Bales, President of Free the Slaves, the sister, U.S. sister organization of Anti-Slavery International, the world's oldest human rights organization. His book, Disposable People, New Slavery in the Global Economy, was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Dr. Bales, Kevin, welcome to International Focus. Great to be here, Rob. Thanks. And, and as we said in the intro, this is a term, modern slavery, which maybe strikes some people as a bit odd. They think of it as an antiquated practice. And you've, you've dedicated your life over the last several years to, to, to studying this and bringing it to light and to doing something about it. So maybe you could give us a bit of context of what we mean when we say modern slavery. Sure. And what's interesting about modern slavery is that, in some ways, it's not modern at all. Uh, slavery throughout all of human history has had a few characteristics in, in which you just decide, is this person a slave or not? And those characteristics are if someone is, uh, their life is completely controlled by someone else, that violence is used to maintain that control, that they're being economically exploited, and they're not being paid anything, anything beyond subsistence. They get food and shelter. Now, that, that, that's what makes slavery. But, of course, we tend to not see the core. We tend to, tend to see the packaging. And the packaging has been everything from a legal system based on race in the American South in 1850 to uh, ideas of ch uh, people controlled by, for religious reasons in Ghana uh, in, the, in the 19th century as well, or India where it's uh, called a debt bondage, and there's, a, there's a nominally a debt, but in fact it's not really a debt. It's, in fact, it's enslavement and so forth. But once you take away the packaging, you still have slavery. There is one brand new thing about slavery, but we can we can talk about that as we go. Well, so so it's not just then a, a def. Not like we've changed the term, which takes things we previously didn't consider to be slavery now to be slavery. But you're saying that in, in fact a lot of those core elements are, have, exactly. are, are still the same. It is true that as people, uh, especially in the late 20th century, began to decide that there wasn't any more slavery. There was, but they thought there wasn't. And they begin to say, well, the, the word is up for grabs. So that you had these moments when people said, well, you know, if there's not any real slavery anymore, then we're going to start using that word for anything, almost anything, to dramatize that situation. Uh, I remember once in, in, the, in, the, in the 1990s, I was taking part in the United Nations Working Group on Contemporary Forms of Slavery, and a delegation came to the working group and said, we would like you to declare incest to be a form of slavery. Okay, I never got that logic. I, I never understood how, you know, incest is bad enough. You don't have to call it slavery. And slavery is bad enough. You don't have to call it incest. But we've had to work hard over the last 10 years to really reclaim the word for what it really is. So who are these modern slaves, and, and what are they doing, and, and as we said in the beginning, the, their connection to the, to the global economy? Can we start with that first question. Who, who are these people? Well, they're vulnerable people. I mean, uh, around the world, there are about 27 million people in slavery. There's slavery in almost every country. Uh, they are concentrated. The largest numbers are in South Asia, India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, but also large numbers in Southeast Asia, North and West Africa, smaller numbers in South America. And then, as I said, almost every other country has some slavery. The United States probably has something as a minimum, something like 50,000 people in real slavery. In terms of what they're doing, well, they're doing in some ways what slaves have always done, dirty, dangerous, demeaning jobs. So uh, it could be agriculture, mining, extraction. They can be cutting down the Amazon rainforest, which is what a lot of slaves do there. Uh, it could, they can be uh, caught up into prostitution. Uh, they can be domestic servants in people's homes. Really, anything that you can think of a criminal, or I should say anything a criminal could think of, uh, uh, as a way to exploit another person, you'll, you'll often find a slave doing that. In a few places in the world, there are still slaves who are 
um, enslaved against religious ideas. So what are called Devadasi slaves in India or Trakosi temple slaves in West Africa are actually young women who have been enslaved strangely as an atonement for sins committed by other family members. Uh, it's, a, well, it's part of that packaging that right. has been around slavery in so many different cultures and so many different societies. And what is the link then with, with the global economy in terms of um, what, is the, what is the benefit people are getting from the labor of these slaves? How do they tie into the, to the, the broader economic picture? Well, the, the, the economic benefit doesn't normally actually accrue into the global economy. It accrues and is held by the slaveholders themselves. So um, slaves, for example, uh, grow cocoa. They grow cotton. Uh, they grow and uh, process sugar. They mine uh, tantalum, a mineral that we have to have for our cell phones. They mine gold. Uh, they, they, they burn trees down to make charcoal to feed the, the, ste the steel processing plants of Brazil. Okay. Uh, the people who take the profit from the slavery, however, are not the big industries. They're the slaveholders on the ground. Because in almost every one of those industries, the amount of slavery is a small fraction. It's not like cotton in the Deep South before the Civil War. Maybe 2% of cocoa farms in the world have slaves. Maybe 3% of the sugar plantations in the world have slaves. Maybe 10%, we think, of the charcoal producers in Brazil use slave labor. So, so the world market prices apply. And if you're an honest farmer and you don't use slave labor, you get the world market price and you have to get by on it. If you're a slaveholder, a slave master farmer, a dishonest farmer, and you use slave labor, you tend to just increase your own personal share of that profit because you keep your labor costs to an absolute minimum. The way it touches us in our lives, however, is that once it leaves the farm gate or the mine or whatever, it flows into that global commodity market, whatever that is, cotton, sugar, tantalum, steel, whatever. And then that flows into a global market, and that global market transforms it into products, uh, the steel in the chairs that we're sitting in, uh, the cotton in your shirt, so on and so forth, uh, that flow directly into our economy and into our homes. Uh, so in that way, it really does touch us in, in various ways that we have no idea about. It's very difficult to do that tracing because the total amount of slavery as a proportion is very small. So, you know, we say that, you know, in, the, in that nice blue shirt that you've got on right now, there may be threads of slave cotton, right. but it's right. not a slave cotton shirt, right. but threads. Um, a lot of the work that we do with industries and a lot of the work that we have done, especially with the chocolate industry, is to work through ways to very carefully trace the, the commodity and to intervene at the point where the work needs to be done. It's, it's no use boycotting shirts right. or cocoa at, a, at the shopping mall. That's f 15 steps removed along the, the product chain. You have to stop the slavery where it happens, and that's at the farm gate. So that really raises then this whole other issue, which, which I, I, I was uh, struck by when, when looking at your, your new book, which I want to talk about in, in a minute. For a lot of people, I'm um, given the difficulties of ending this, given that it's been around for a long time. The choices for most people is I'd rather not know about it because, uh, it, it, as you were saying, even for yourself, it, it was a long time before you were really aware of this. Or uh, there's a fatalistic sort of assumption. Well, it's always been that way. It always will be that way. There's nothing we can do about it. And, and I want to I take a minute to plug your, your book, um, Ending Slavery, uh, because in here you're, you're both optimistic and practical about the fact that we really could end slavery. So what gives you that hope? Well, a, a whole number of factors give me that hope. And one of them is, is what I've just mentioned. You know, the fact that the, the total amount of slave input to the economy is so, such a tiny fraction, uh, we actually stand at a moment in history where slave input to the global economy is at, is at its lowest level ever in human history. The 27 million people in slavery is in fact, that's a big number, sure, but it's also the tiniest fraction of the global population to ever be in slavery. No country, no economy, no industry can say, we are dependent on this. You know, it's regrettable, but you know, if we stop it, jobs will be lost, economies will be destroyed. No, if we stopped it like that, no one would be caused pain and difficulty, except for the criminals, the handful of criminals that hold slaves. So slavery itself as a 
very long-lasting historic institution of, of, of human history uh, is actually poised on a precipice and, and is at a point where it can be pushed over that precipice because it is fragmented, it is fractional, and, uh, and, and it, there are no great protectors. Well, it sounds on the economic side, it, 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 that's a, it sounds like a very interesting analysis because a lot of times when, you have, when you're trying to make change, say, in the production of carbon emissions, you'll have large seg segments of industry saying, well, we can't do that because it will, it will debilitate us and make us uncompetitive. And, and you're almost suggesting it's, it's the opposite with, with slavery. It is indeed. I mean, if, if, uh, you know, if we dramatically alter carbon emissions in, in the global economy today, certainly in the, nor in the rich north, our, lifesty our lifestyles would, ha would have dramatic changes. Uh, if we could end slavery overnight, we would never notice. We would literally never notice. It wouldn't change the price of anything. Uh, what would change, though, in a fairly short order is, well, obviously the lives of the people in slavery would change very much to the, to the positive. But what we would also notice is that um, the economies of the poorest countries would be, begin to have an uptick. They would begin to improve. Uh, everywhere that we do our work and our research, uh, we find that there is a significant freedom dividend, that when people come out of slavery, they have an, a chance to become consumers. And I know that sounds a, a crazy reason to end slavery. We should do it because it's morally right. But in fact, you end slavery and the economy improves because they begin doing all the things that they've been hoping to do for years buy plenty of food, have clothing, get their kids out of the workplace, build some schools, get access to medicine for when they're ill and so forth. And the spiral begins. And it's very, very thrilling to watch this. In a sense, you know, what happens is what should have happened in the United States after 1865. If the African American population had been allowed access to credit, education, political participation, if they had had that little 40 acres and a mule or some sort of burst of input to allow them to step up, we would have seen an enormous transformation in the poorest states in this country, I believe. Instead, we botched the emancipation. You know, four million people lifted out of slavery and then dumped with no access to credit or education or politics or anything, and then s suffering in extreme discrimination. We find that if you don't do it the old American way, you end up with tremendously positive outcomes. And, and you know, on our watch, we, we don't want to end slavery today and then have another 15 generations of discrimination and prejudice. That's, that's, that's not the way to go. Uh, uh, we're just about at our, at our break, uh, so I want, I want to come back and I want to continue on this this notion. We've talked a little bit about the, the freedom dividend. I want to go more into that and, and sure. some of the other issues that are involved in, in ending this practice of slavery. Uh, we'll be back with Dr. Kevin Bales talking about modern-day slavery and how to end it on International Focus. We'll be back in just a moment. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus. We're talking with Dr. Kevin Bales, author of Ending Slavery, about just that. How, how do we end slavery? And, and Kevin, you're, you're, you're talking about the economics of this and the, 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 the actually it's a, the net positive we get on the economic side. And, and I think, the, I imagine the corollary to that is that if there's a loser in this, it tends to be the individual slave owners who are, whose, the benefit is really just a personal selfish benefit for them in this. Well, you know, that's right. But there's actually even a but there, which is kind of odd which is that in those forms of sedentary slavery, uh, long-lasting hereditary debt bondage slavery in places like South Asia, when the village economies begin to transform and spiral upward, even the ex-slaveholders benefit because they are the ones who are most likely to own land which they will then rent or have the little shops, tea shop, whatever, that begin to be patronized by people who are now making a living as opposed to making no living whatsoever. So we, we've talked about the, the, the positives that could happen if, we, if people make the transition from slavery to, to, to freedom. Um, so there is that in-between part. So how, how do we do that? How, how do we get them to make that transition or help them make that transition? Yeah. Well, now, th there's no silver bullet for that. And, uh, but w what this book is is, pre is pretty much a, a box of silver bullets. And it says, um, 
in this kind of context, you have to work in this way and so forth. So, for example, um, if you're actually a operating at, say, the village level, if the one we were just talking about, well, you know, we've learned a number of things about that. Firstly, uh, kicking in a door and rushing people out doesn't help as much as it might, as you might think. Uh, simply because if people don't understand the ideas of what it means to live in freedom, uh, which I appreciate is very hard for us as free people to think of a of a life with no freedoms whatsoever. But you have to learn it. Even Frederick Douglass, you know, the the famous abolitionist leader who, who was enslaved as a youth, writes in his memoirs about the day he became free in his mind and how that happened several years before he became free in his body. But that, but that that was crucial, and that if if someone had taken him to freedom before his mind was uh, understood freedom, then it would have been very likely that he would have fallen back into slavery, and that can happen. So, one of the things that we know is that we have to engage communities and to help them to understand their rights. At the same time, preparing for them an alternative way to make a living, if they have to in fact be removed from the kind of work that they're doing as a slave. Because without that economic autonomy, again, they can reach situations of vulnerability that can bring them back. Now, that's at the local level. And there's also that, a, a particular moment that is very, in a word, dangerous. Because there is a moment at which the slaveholder realizes that they're about to lose their investment. You try to conceal that as long as you can, uh, unless you're literally doing a kick-in-the-door raid mm -hmm. kind of situation. Um, and a lot of our, of our careful thought revolves around imagining that moment before they do and preparing a situation in which we avoid any final use of violence to hold on to the slave that they want to control. So that involves sometimes bringing a, an honest police officer with you. Sometimes it means spiriting people away before the slaveholder even grasps that they're, they've lost their slaves and so forth. Um, but that's very important. And then to find that way, which is often not unique in the sense that it's always about education and rights and, and economic autonomy and citizenship to ease people as quickly as possible into a life of dignity. And once they're in that situation of economic autonomy and citizenship, it becomes almost impossible to re-enslave them. But, of course, the book is also about not just what we do at the individual level. It's about what the UN can do and what national governments can do. I, okay. I want to get to that, but I, I, sure. want, I want to come back sure. just a little bit. I mean, so I'm very curious about that, that, that how you – I mean, it's not like slave owners have a sign out saying, hey, I have slaves, and we want to free them, come on in. Um, how do you how – do, it must be fairly labor-intensive uh, in terms of the work of these individuals on the ground who are, who are identifying the people in slavery and, and somehow getting access to them in a way that's not yeah. – uh, too conspicuous. Well, you're, 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 you're right about all of that. The thing that is uh, wonderful about human beings and slavery as a, as a human construct is that they, they're very different as you go from place to place. And uh, in, in that, those parts of the world where the greatest amount of slavery exists, it also is pretty clear and obvious and out where people can see it. Right. So that uh, if you know how to see it, if you know how to look at it, so that these workers in the field these uh, people in this factory, the people in that mine, whatever, uh, are not concealed as the way they are in the United States, for example. Slavery in the United States is very much a hidden activity because it's a criminal hidden activity. But, in, but most of the, many, many of, I would say most of the, of the slaves in the world are where you can see them and find them if you know how to look. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, these, these on the ground workers, who are real heroes, come in and reach out and very gently begin a conversation. And if it's, for example, with people who have been in hereditary debt bondage slavery, that conversation can take months because they don't believe that there's anything wrong with their situation. They say, well, our family has always belonged to that family. And, and then there's this debt, which is almost like a cosmic thing to them that has existed for generations that they know they must work to fulfill, but it never goes away. And... You know, it takes a long time of people saying, you know, in the village over there, there are families who used to be just like you, but now they've changed, and they actually own a piece of land. And this is, like, revolutionary, truly revolutionary. And it takes a long time to bring themselves to, the, to both the comprehension and the courage to step out. So, so uh, in, in the book, you talk about a 25-year plan and, and that... There are roles for both the, the obviously the, the people on the ground who have these intense relationships with people, but, but also various communities around the world, labor unions and faith communities, 
governments and international organizations. So you started to talk about that, but maybe you could give us a sense of, of, of what it would take in, the, in that global sense to make this effort succeed. Well, let me get to, you know, in some ways the bottom line um, in terms of like how much would it cost in the global sense? Because if we do it one family at a time, one village at a time, rescue one child at a time, it'll take us three or four hundred years. We, we can't do it right. that way. Those, those heroes of the ground are fantastic, but they really are, you know, the, the individual workers. We've got to bring in international organizations and governments. And we should, because they've promised that they're going to do this. I mean, when you pass a law that says there's not going to be any slavery in your country, you've made a promise to your people that there's not going to be any slavery. And we have a law in every country, and we have international conventions, United Nations, ILO, and so forth, that completely cover this. So how do you do it? Well, resources is part of that. But um, the remarkable thing that surprised me as I worked on this book was the calculation of how much it would cost to end slavery. As we looked at all different types of liberations around the world, and when I say end, I mean how much does it cost to bring a person not just to freedom but to that full economic autonomy, dignity, and citizenship? How much does that cost? Well, the average, as it turns out, around the world is around $400, Now, it, which is chicken feed. But that, the reason why it's so inexpensive is because most of the slaves live in the poorest places where those costs are low, like India. In the United States, just for comparison, it costs about $30,000 to take a person from slavery to autonomy. But in most of the world, it averages around 400. If you multiply your 27 million slaves by that, you get $10.8 billion. That's more money than I've got, probably than you've got, but that's what Americans spend on going to the movies every year. That's what Americans spend on internet grocery shopping in a year. It's what, it's what in Boston they spent digging that tunnel under the River Charles, the Big Dig project, which doesn't even work correctly, <laughs> you know. And that was just one city. Um, in the global economy, it's a, it's a drop. And with this freedom dividend, it actually then pays, pays, itself, back. It pays itself back very, very quickly. And, you know, $10.8 uh, uh, is three weeks in Iraq under the current uh, political regime in the United States. It's the sort of thing that is very difficult for a, for a, a human rights organization like mine to mobilize $10.8 billion. But between the major governments of the world and the major foundations, um, over a 25-year period, we're, it's, it's almost nothing. So, so, what, so um, outside of then of the, of the, the official community and, 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 the, and resources, talk about some of these other organizations. You, you, you mentioned that there, there's a role for, for lots of elements of civil society in this. So what are some of those roles? You know, industry, business, is, has plays a very important role in this, and, and we've really learned that in the last five years. Um, because in spite of, of a number of people often feeling that uh, corporations are evil, Right, uh, and that they want to do bad things. We have found that uh, it's very difficult to find any business person in Western Europe and North America, anyway, who says, "Oh, yeah, slave labor. I think that's a great thing. That's it's good, good for my bottom line." Because it really doesn't affect their bottom line anyway. But they see the moral wrongness in this, and they want they don't want the, they don't want their customers to think, "Oh, this is the company I buy slavery from." They are the ones who know their product chains best. It's their job. They better know their project product chains. And they're also the ones who, um, without enormous amounts of work, can be persuaded to bankroll uh, and to pay for the work at the bottom of their product chain, to safeguard those villages, to do the education necessary, to provide the safety net um, shelters for if, if slave labor happens to be found in, their, in the production of their raw material. Now, it does take a moral step, because you know, there's no legal requirement for you if you own a company to protect children in a far foreign country that happen to put something into the product chain that 15 steps later reaches your factory in Milwaukee. But if you take moral responsibility for your product, um, then it is something for you to do. We have just about a minute and a half left. I've Great. Two questions I want to I want okay. to get you to address quickly if I can. When you talk about the moral responsibility, one of the communities that's really stepped forward on this is I've been faith-based communities. Can you say just a quick word about about their role and, and what it's meant in the last several years? Yeah, and 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 it can be said very briefly in that every anti-slavery movement in history, and there have been three great movements before this one. Uh, 
were initiated by faith-based communities, pretty much initiated. There were politicians involved as well, but the real on-the-ground slog of raising public awareness and setting the agenda that this is an issue that must be tackled occurred with faith, faith-based communi- faith communities, and that's happening today. Are they uh, necessarily doing the breakthroughs on the ground or working with the United Nations? No, but what they are doing is raising the public consciousness to a level that politicians are beginning to be responsive, and that's crucially important. And I can't let you leave without uh, asking a question. About what, so what, if I'm watching the show, uh, read, perhaps reading your book, what, what is it that I can do uh, to help get involved in this and to, and to support the work you've Well, we're at, we're at step one, you know, it's, it's, and the step one is always awareness. Uh, that's just the nature of the situation. So you can't solve a problem you don't understand. So, you know, it's a little blatant, but I would say get a book like this and, and, have, and have a read. Look at our website, which is freetheslaves.net, freetheslaves.net, um, or any other of the anti-slavery organizations uh, or groups or anti-human trafficking groups to begin to understand. In the United States, there's a lot we can do about learning to see slavery around us, and there's a lot that we can do in terms of, well, you know what I said, a $400 gets people out of slavery and into autonomy. For most of us, that's going to be our tax refund check, right? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't that be a nice way to use well, it? Dr. Kevin Bales, uh, Free the Slaves, uh, thank you very much for, for being here. Uh, so freetheslaves.net is the website. We encourage you to look and get involved. Thank you very much uh, for watching National Focus. We'll see you next week. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website.